Man, well, we're ready to rock and roll this morning. I mean, well, God is good. He loves us. And uh, let's jump into what we've just been talking about, what the Lord's been sharing with us about the word encounter. And uh, so if you've got your Bibles, let's turn there for a moment to, um, I'm going to get you to go. Where do I want you to go? That's the thing. Go to Leviticus chapter 10. I want you just to start there. And before, before I read that out, I want to just, again, preface it or just say again what the Lord has been talking to us about just as a church family. And I mentioned this last week, but we took some time, you know, just to really get before the Lord. Lord, what are you speaking to us as a church family? And aren't you glad that God isn't, you know, his word isn't just something that happened a long time ago. It's still active today that God still speaks today. Yes, three people are happy about that. That is good news for us, that God speaks today. And uh, so just in that time with him and just finding out, Lord, what do you, what do you want? What, do you, what are you saying for us as a church family? And I really want you to grab hold of this word, that this word for us as a church family, and again, those that are watching online, is this word, encounter. It would say encounter. And I think it's awesome because 2020, well, we've, we've had a lot of run-ins. We've had a lot of encounters, so to say, with numerous various things that have come up. Right? Maybe it's, it maybe hit home to you personally. Maybe it hit your job. Maybe it hit your finances. You, you name it, it's, it could have hit you in a whole plethora of different ways. But what I love about God is God saying, hey, I want to encounter my family again. And not that he's ever stopped. He continues to do it. But just to put an emphasis on it again. Right? Every once in a while, it's just good to talk about it again, about the goodness of God, who he is, and what he likes to do. So he said it in this phrase to me. He says, we are to expect, we are to prepare our hearts, and to create environments for encounters with him. So this is what we're focusing in on. And again, again, just to preface a few things, we're not here looking for encounters. We're not here searching encounters. We're here going after a man. His name is Jesus. And in going him, of course, you know, Psalm 22, verse 3, it says that he inhabits the praises of his people. We are to expect encounters. We say expected. Did you expect it when you walked in this morning? Or were you just saying, man, I'm going to get some calories as I eat that donut back there? Well, we expect that, man. If you've got people looking on the backs, if I, if, on the boxes of things, if I eat this, I'm going to expect a moment on the lips is going to be a you know, lifetime on the hips, and I don't know if I'm able to do all that. Right? We expect those types of things. So are we expecting the presence of God when you walked into it this morning? Because that changes everything is your expectation. If you come in with very low expectations, guess what? They'll be met. If you come with very high expectations, guess what? They will be met because God is the God who does not disappoint. It says in his word, he doesn't know how to disappoint. In fact, he never will. Man, aren't you thankful? Has God any, disappointed anybody in this room yet before? No, not I, man. God is good and he is faithful to do what he says. Now, we talked last week um, just about sharing a little bit about what it looks like in regards to the atmosphere that we set, I mean, as a, as a corporate body. And one of the things that we really discussed and we focused in on is just what we're setting together as a church family. And this is what we want to do. You know, in Psalm chapter, I believe it's 68 that we really went over last week. This is our prayer that the psalmist actually said, when I come into your presence, I come in already ready to go. Right? Not just when the worship service is done. Oh, now I'm ready to sing. No, as soon as you walk through these doors and you knowing that you're gathering with the brethren and the cistern, that you are ready to rock and roll at that moment. Anybody ready to rock and roll when you walked in? Yeah. You, anybody ready to rock and roll now? Yeah. Awesome. It should always be ready. Man, I want to give God my best. He doesn't deserve my second best. He deserves my absolute best. If he gave it all for me, I'm able to come on a Sunday morning at 10, get a little sleep in, get my donut, get my coffee, and give him everything that I got. He's worthy of that all. And so in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3, we saw this from the word, that any time that you want to come to God or you want to be in his presence, God actually sets the standard. He tells you how it's going to be. You know, ever, any, any ever had that in a relationship or something where, especially with your kids, how you want to be addressed. It's not just however you want to address me. You kind of lay the parameters of this is how I'm going to be addressed. I got a mama here. She's laying that, laying that down. <laughs> but this is what God's saying for you and I. And the reason is, is because he wants to show you. And I, it's not to say, hey, hey, this is, I better be treated like this. No, I think it's cool that he even tells us what it is because he wants us in his presence. He said this, Leviticus 10, verse 3. He says, by those, this is what God said, saying, by those who come near me, I must. Everybody say must. must. I must be regarded as holy, set apart. Um, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So when we come into the presence of God, together collectively as a body, how do we regard the presence of God? How do we regard him as holy? There's reverence. There's this deep awe and respect for God. And you know what the world is trying to do? It's trying to suck that reverence for God right out of us. 
That's, it's, that's what the devil's honestly trying to do. And everything that you see, which God calls sacred, they call unsacred. Everything is being blasphemed by what the, way, the ways of God. But what God is saying, if we're going to approach him, these are some of the practical ways. And one of them is, I must be regarded as holy. Right? And so this is every time that we come together, I want that to be in your brain, that when I walk into this room, Jesus is going to be honored and glorified in what I do today. Every bite of that donut I take is for the glory of God. Did you know you can do that? You can sip your little latte back there and just go, that's for the glory of God. When you give your offering or your tithes, what is it? It's for the glory of God. When I come and lift my hands, what am I doing? I do it for the glory of, you can have that in your mind and watch it change. Watch your experience change. Cool. All right. Thank you. I think Robert yelled at me on that one. I appreciate that, Robert. That's good. Again, as we said in Psalm 22, verse 3, that God inhabits the praises of his people. And we saw this very clearly last week in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, when the Israelites came to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. When they brought it in, they got all their, their priests. And what they did, they actually cleansed themselves. And then they brought in the Ark. And the trumpets, the lyres, all the instruments came together. And they all said this phrase, he is good and his mercy endures forever. And it says at that moment, when everybody was in unison in praising God, their hearts were connected not only with one another, but towards giving God glory. And as they were saying, he is good and his mercy endures forever. The Bible says at that moment, it says a thick cloud came in and all the priests fell down. Talk about encounter. And that's Old Testament. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 that we are now in a new covenant. We're established on better promises. How much more does our heavenly father want to encounter his children? Israel's not the children of God. They're the servants of God. Who are we? We're called the children of God because we're part of Christ. We're in him. Do you see that? You are called a child of God and he is not an absentee father. He is a father who likes to be close. He's a cuddler. People have this perception of God that he's just kind of one of those standoff dads. Stinky diaper. Man, God, and no matter what it is in your life, he is one who's open arms and he has never changed that stance for you and I. It's always there, wanting to you to embrace him, wanting you to feel the embrace of our God. And that's what I love about Christianity. It's not just a religion where people talk about this God. You're here to experience him as well. That's what changes everything, is our God is here to give you and I experiences because it's out of these experiences that change everything. Anybody have a God experience before? Man, it changes your life. Those are set markers even on your calendar. Man, this was a set marker that Jesus appeared or Jesus said something that impacted my heart. That's what he desires every part of our day. Man, I think that's good. Not just Sunday, every day this is what he longs to do. Are you open to it? That's a question you got to ask. Are you open to it? So we talked about that um, quite a bit last week. And so this week what I want to do is talk about your personal atmosphere. Everybody say personal. personal. Oh, it's going to get personal this morning. <laughs> really? Yeah. I like personal. I like getting in there. I'm not real good at, you know, kind of just little chats. Right? And how are you doing? Yeah, how's the weather? Sure is windy, eh? I, I, don't, I don't really know what else to say. Those leaves sure look pretty. Y yeah. They're dying. I don't really know what else to say. So you got to go a little bit deeper, and so I like to get personal. So let's get up in your grill this morning. Not, your, not mine, yours. We're going to get into your grill this morning. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I want you to turn there for a moment. But I want you just to realize that you and I, we carry an atmosphere wherever you go. You carry an atmosphere wherever you go. What are you carrying? What are other people experiencing when you walk into the room? <laughs> that's a good question to ask. What is your spouse getting from you? And that's, the, that's the best person to ask is your spouse. What is your family getting from you? What are your children getting from you? What is your church getting from you? What is your job getting from you? What, experiencing, what experiences are you leaving with the people once you left the room? What do you carry? And I'll just give you, show you a little example of this. This is the Apostle Paul again talking. He says, thank God, in verse 14, he has made us his captives and he continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now, I want to just make mention of this. Right here, Jesus, he doesn't lead you to victory. He leads you in victory. Now, this is how we got to get our talk. Because what, what this church is all about, we live by faith. Faith is not a subject to us. Faith is a lifestyle to us. What is the lifestyle of faith? Faith, living by faith means is that you are learning to live the life of victory that's already been purchased for you. 
That's the biggest difference. We're not trying to get victory. We're not hoping to see it one day. You and I, as we see 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we are his captives, and that's a good place to be. He, he owns me and you. He owns us. And what he did, does he do? He leads us along in Christ's triumphal procession, meaning he wants to continue to have the parade every single day of victory that he purchased for us. You are not trying to get your healing. You already are. You're not trying to get blessed. You already are. You're not trying to get peace. You already got it. And so what we're learning is not to live by how we feel, not to live by what we see out here. We're to be living and moving by what we see from the word of God, which is our new reality. And that's the lifestyle of faith. So this is, this is what Paul is laying out this to be. And so again, talking about what you and I carry, this is what he goes on to say. Now he uses us. Say he uses me. He's going to use you to spread something. Just like you had that hot bagel this morning. You put that margarine all over it. Lathered it on there. He's ready to spread something using you. What does he want to do? To spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. What smell are you getting this morning? From your neighbor. Smell him. Smell him again. And then check yourself. <laughs> Before you come down on them, do you make sure that you wash this morning? That's a good question to ask. But he says a sweet perfume, verse 15. He says, our lives are like a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those being saved and those by, being those, by those that are perishing. So what's he saying? That there is two different, two different smells that we're giving off. Now, in verse, verse 16, to those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. So to the world, when you walk into the room, what do they smell? Oh, what's wrong with you? It's something that you carry. Can you see this? And look at the next one. But those who are being saved, we are to be a life-giving perfume. So now again, he's talking about himself as those, like us as the apostles. This is what we are carrying. So the question I want to ask is, what are you carrying? What do people get from you? Do other believers get a sweet-smelling perfume from you? Or they're like, dear Lord, you stink. I can't believe you're a Christian. Sometimes you have to ask that question. You, you're a Christian? You say that Jesus is your Lord? Dear Lord, there's something wrong with you. So what stench are we giving off? And then he says, and who is adequate for such a task as this? Um, and that's all I wanted to say. But right there, are you, um, are you aware of the carrier of his presence? Are you aware that you carry something? Are you experiencing Jesus on a regular basis? Are others experiencing him through you? Because the reality is that you and I are to, supposed to experience him every day of our life. We're supposed to. So if you don't like the atmosphere that you're carrying, guess what? Change it. You can change your scent. Right? It's like after you go to the gym, you smell like a whole gym locker. And how do you change it? You just jump in the shower and change it up. Well, it's the same way spiritually. You can change it. Say it, I can change. I can change. That's good news. Anybody not happy with where they're at? Guess what? The good news is you're not stuck. What Jesus came to do is he made you unstuck. Okay. Now, again, now here's the thing. If I want to see change in my life, God needs access. He's always looking for access points in your and my life. This is a misconception that we see quite a bit in Christian circles is we think, okay, I need to see change in my life. I'm going to just slap a prayer up there and hopefully something sticks and then I'll see change in my life. Everything God does is from the inside out. He needs an access point. God's not going to just change whatever in your and my life. He needs access because again, usually a lot of the times that we're dealing with the things that we're dealing in our life is actually fruit or stuff that's just the cause of something. God doesn't want to just deal with some of these root issues or the the little fruit issues, he wants to get to the very root of the matter because he cares about you and I. He loves you and his love is able to cast out all fear. His love is able to change anybody from, that's the nastiest person. All of a sudden, the love of God comes in and changes him completely. Remember, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. It's his goodness. And so this is what we're proclaiming, right? You can find lots of scriptures on judgment. You can find lots of scriptures on love and mercy. It just depends where your heart's at can find it anywhere now so let's talk about this so how does God have access to me how does he have it it's my heart everybody say my heart this is his access point 
I believe it's Proverbs chapter 20, verse 28. It says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord or the light bulb of the Lord. This is where God dwells. This is where he operates on the inside of you and I. And we know this, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, he was telling the, the prophet Samuel, he says that God, people look to the outside. Right? This is when he was about to pick the new king. Right? And there's Eliab, David's oldest brother. And he's buff, he's tan, he's like the macho man. He's looking good, man. He's got the chest. It's just booming. And uh, Samuel looks at him and goes, You the man! Man, just suns up, guns out, just ripped beyond. I think he kind of looked like my cousin Jared over here. He's, he's pretty ripped. I'd ask you to take off your shirt here, Jared, but I, I won't, I won't. Just massive, just huge, right? And all of a sudden, what happens? God says to Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. No, 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 no. Every, you men, you guys look to the outside, but I look at the heart. And what did God say about Eliab? I have rejected him. That's a big deal. Why? Because his heart wasn't right. So then he all of a sudden gone down the line. Is there, is there somebody else that I, I'm not seeing here? He says, yeah, there's one other guy that's just tending a few sheep out there. David. I chose David. Why? Because he is a man after my own heart. His heart was before God that God was able to have access in. That changes everything. Does God have access to you? He needs access. Come on, say it with me. Access. If he doesn't have access, he's got no way to get into you and my life. He can't. God will not just come in. And there's a few songs that even you may have heard that, man, God, you tear down walls and you bursting in through lives and you change lives. He doesn't. <laughs> we have to get that thought out of our brain. Oh, man, yeah, God just, man, he just wrecked that person's life and changed everything. No, unless he's given access, God will not come in. Revelation 3.20 says he stands at the door and he knocks. If you will be willing to hear his voice and open your heart, guess what? He will come in and dine with you. There's fellowship there. God does not come in and just tear down. Why? Because he is so interested in your and my freedom. He cares about freedom a lot. Freedom is a big deal in God's eyes. He wants to be wanted. So you and I, does he have access? Can he encounter you? You know what the crazy thing is? is well, of course he can. But does he have access? Well, if he wants to, then won't he? No. <laughs> this is a big deal. And this is what the misconception on Christianity is, is God will just come in and do whatever, whenever he pleases. No, he does not. So if you want him, listen, we use the, use the word, if you invite Jesus into your life. It's as simple, it's the, what it is, you invite him. The same way you invite a friend over. Hey, do you, do you want to come over and hang out a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. He needs the invitation. Think about it. God Almighty, the creator of the heaven and the universe, is actually bound by your and my invitation to him. If you want him, guess what? You can have them all. But you and I are having as much of God as we want. God will not force anything in. But here's the thing. If you give him an inch, guess what? He'll take an inch. The devil, on the other hand, works opposite. You give him an inch, he takes a mile. And he is a punk. It just starts with just a little, little puff. It just starts with a little bit of a, you know, a hard glug glug. It starts there, but he'll take you further than you want to go. Leaving people bound, leaving people stuck. It's just a little pornographic image. It starts there. And what does he want to do? He wants to open up a whole world to it. And all of a sudden now you're strapped going, how do I get out of it? And it's still Jesus. But here's the thing. You have to invite him in. He will not just come in and take over whatever you want in, in our lives. You have to give him access. So again, the access point is our heart. Just saying, I love God, that's great, but he wants the heart connected to it. And we can see this 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, the eyes of the Lord. Think about this. The eyes, that what, are, what is God doing this morning? He's searching the entire earth in order to strengthen those, look at this, whose hearts are fully committed. He's looking for a committed heart. What does he want to do? He wants to strengthen. God wants to show off on how good he is in your and my life. That's what he wants to do. So again, what's his access point? It's his heart. And again, he invites us to move closer to it. James 4 verse 8. I know maybe you've heard this before, but I want to just bring it up again so that you hear it again. Because maybe you're at a good, good place with God. Guess what? There's more. Maybe you're not in a very good place this morning. Guess what? That's okay. But there's more. Give him access. Look at this invitation. Can we read it out together? Just the first line. Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer to you. So whose turn is it? 
My turn. Other translation, you go first. You move first. You bring your heart first. Well, why doesn't God move? He already did. He moved 2,000 years ago on that cross. It wasn't just he died for us and he took care of the whole package. It's an all-deal package with him, an all-inclusive package that he came and purchased for. So what do you and I need to do? We have to move our hearts towards him. I would say, take a step. I take a step. Guess what he does? He takes a step. I take a step. He takes a step. Because whatever degree that I give him, he'll take it. If I take a jump, guess what? He'll jump. <laughs> if I take a long one of those rip your jeans stances, guess what he'll do? He's going to do the exact same thing. He probably wears a robe or something, so it's not as no ripping going on there. <laughs> okay. So now how do I move my heart closer to him? I want to show you this, Romans chapter 12 through 11. I want to just show this. So how do I move my heart? The first thing that I want to say with this is that the reality is that my hunger is up to me. Hunger is up to me. Say with me. Hunger is up to me. How hungry do you want to be? You can be hungry and you can be, meh, I'm good. It's totally up to you. But don't condemn anybody who's actually hungrier than you. And they're just, they're just weird and radical. That's normal in God's eyes. So the hunger is totally up to you and I. Romans chapter 12, verse 11, he says, Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him. How hot? Boiling. Come on, how hot? Boiling. Boiling. Some of you just say, flick the switch. Same way you boil water to get that tea. What do you do? You flip the switch. Why you want some hot tea? Well, it's the same way. Come on, mama. <laughs> My mom will literally, she'll, she'll turn the kettle on, and if it's off for 30 seconds, she'll reboil it just to make sure that it's just hot. So my mouth is like calloused because of her. She, we just, you drink hot tea. You want some tea? Yeah, great. Oh, it just clicked. Oh, I missed it. 10 seconds. Ah, flick it up again. No, mom, it's good. No, no, it ain't good until it's like burning the cup that you're drinking it out of. But he's telling you and I, what's the, whose job is it to remain hunger? I have to keep my passion toward him boiling hot and the world that we're living in is doing everything it can to suck the passion to get you and I just so distracted by what's going on out there that we lose sight of the awesomeness of our God my passion is up to me if I'm not hungry guess whose fault it is it's mine and if I'm hungry for God guess whose fault that is it's mine so you determine the hunger level and it's important that you and I we stay hungry and I'm going to get to this in a sec I'll just say this but the hunger for God is the safest place for my life to be my hunger for God is the safest place for me to live. Why? It'll keep me from doing something stupid. <laughs> You're wondering, how did somebody, how did that person get so involved in that? Or how did somebody, oh, they were on the worship team, or they did this and they did that. They were a believer. They were a strong leader within the church, and all of a sudden, they fell back. How do these things happen? Can I tell you how? They let the switch go down, and they never flicked it back up. By offense, by bitterness, by jealousy, by something stupid outside here. What happens? All of a sudden, man, although they're serving God, they're giving in, all of a sudden somebody says something. And all of a sudden you hear that little, the little kettle click. The boiling thing's off. And they start festering. What? How? Why did they say that? And what happens? They're not realizing the boiling water is just simmering. Going down, going down. Before you know it, how did I get involved in this? How, where did this come from? You didn't, you forgot to flip the switch again. My hunger for God keeps me in a place of forgiveness. My hunger for God keeps me in a place where if somebody says something nasty about me, I'm not going to care. Why? Because he's way more important than anybody has got to say out here. I don't care what people think or say about me because most of the time they're wrong anyway. My mom always said, if you, if you knew me, you'd like me. Some people don't like me. Did you know that some people don't like me? You yeah, would. Anybody in this room that don't like me, my mama wants to talk to you. She, she'll take care of this for you. You got an issue with me? Well, you talk to my mama. She says that I, my mama said I'm cool. You is kind. You is important. You is special. Thanks, mom. Again. But here's the thing, you know what the most challenging part in Christianity is? Is to be hungry and full at the same time. Hungry and full at the same time. Hungry and full at the same time. 
That even though I've all of a sudden I had my experience and my good time with the Lord this day, that I flipped that switch this morning. I flipped that switch every day. I flipped that kettle switch up. And man, I'm boiling hot towards him. The most dangerous or the most toughest thing is, is to go into the next day. And after just having a great encounter that I keep that switch on. So I'm full, but yet I'm hungry for more every single day. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. You know, um, because reality is a hungry heart is a sign of spiritual health. Just same way naturally, I mean, especially for your parents, anybody ever have a sick child before, physically speaking? I have. What's the first thing that goes? Is their hunger. Well, the same way that you see it in the natural realm, when somebody doesn't feel like eating, you know that there's a problem in the natural. Well, it's the same way in the spiritual realm. When people are hungry for the things of God, you know there's spiritual health. So if you're not hungry, it means that there's a sickness going on. Something needs to go on. And you what you got to do? you got to flip that switch again and say, God, I'm making a step closer to your heart again. Because, again, your heart, you're the one that's in charge of it all. Maturity in the kingdom of God is maintaining my hunger for God. The safest place, as I said, for me to live is in my hunger for God because hunger is a place of humility that keeps me in a place of dependency. And what's the way forward in life? Humility. In, this, in the, what we're seeing today, with all the chaos that we're seeing today, you know what the way forward is? Humility. Humility is the only way forward. Pride will get you nowhere. But my hunger for God keeps me in this place of complete dependency on God. And the other thing about this is if I don't remain hungry, I'll live off of yesterday's investment, yesterday's switch. And that becomes a very dangerous place because I'll stagnate. And that's what we actually say because if you're stagnating, if you're not moving forward, you're actually falling backwards. And all of a sudden you're wondering, man, I was so passionate for God back in 2003. That's great, but have you flipped the switch in 2020? Because that's, that's a major difference. I had an experience with God in 2019. Great. But it's 2020. I had an experience with God in August. Wonderful. But now it's October. It's Thanksgiving. Have you had an experience yet? Because I can't live off of last year's turkey. I can't even live off of yesterday's turkey, let alone last year. I need it a few times a year. And how much more the presence in the kingdom of God. I cannot survive off of last week's stuff. It will not work. And I know you've heard that before. But again, this is the safest place for me to live. Is that if I stay in my place of hunger for God, I know I cannot fail. You hearing me this morning? I will not fail. Why? Because my hunger for God is turned on. When I remain hungry for Him, that means that I am not proud in the sense of, I got this in my life. I can take care of my own life. I can't. My family needs me hungry for God. My wife needs me hungry for God. Why? So I don't screw it up. (laughs) I need my wife hungry for God. Why? So she doesn't screw it up. (laughs) So this is why we make room for one another. Jamie, you need some time with the Lord? Give it to her. Take it. Rather than, oh man, there she goes praying again. Here, Lord, you're always praying. and You can't watch a movie with me. Man, you better be thankful that woman is praying. Why, if she don't, it's going to be ugly for you. <laughs> my hunger for God keeps me in dependency of who he is and what he can do in my life. Okay. Now, you know, I just, I'll probably get into this at some point down here, but I'm not going to turn there. For your own study, I encourage you to read Psalm 107, uh, 33 through 36. But the way that I kind of paraphrased it and saw it for my own self is that God has left a transforming influence to the hungry ones. Did you know that the transforming of this world doesn't belong to government, doesn't belong to those that are in kind of political power, those in the entertainment business? It belongs to his people. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, by remember those that are called by my name, if they would humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, what do you do? I'll heal their land. Where does he tell, where is the change is going to take place? It's the church. It's us. It's his people. So you got to stop relying on what government does or doesn't do. They don't have answers. Clearly, I'm sure you can see that by now. (laughs) You hear some of them talk and you're like, how stupid can you get? And you know what? But here's our problem. Our problem is we keep listening to the stuff. And what does it do? It triggers us even more. Okay, I'm going to move on from that one. But God has left the transforming influence to the hungry ones. In other words, he says, God wants the state of cities to be in the hands of the hungry. This city is not going to be determined by what other evil influences want to do here. How is it going to be determined? By what the hungry ones have to say. 
So if you're wondering, like, God, I've been praying for this city. Keep your hunger turned on. That is your only job. You and I don't change anything by our efforts, by our, even our motives to wanting to see it take place. You and I, we change a city by our hunger because when we stay hungry for God, he can trust us with more. Influence, that's how influence comes. Influence comes by stronger, hungrier hearts. All right. Hunger pulls on heaven. Hungry people pull on a greater reality. It's just what we do. That's why we spend the time in the presence of God this morning is because what we're able to do is we're able to pull on a greater, greater reality that's out there than rather what people are just facing on a regular basis. We got to learn how to do that. Okay? So what do I do? Two things I'm going to share and then I'll be done. Number one is I got to guard my hunger. I have to protect it. If you're like, if you're this hungry for God, protect it with everything you got. I'm going to guard this hunger because out of more hunger comes more hunger. Remember in the kingdom of God, you get hungry by continuing feeding. In the natural, you, get, you eat and then you're full. But in the spiritual world, the more that you eat, the hungrier that you get. Okay. So Psalm, look at this, Proverbs 23, 17. This is something the Lord's been speaking to me about since the summer. And I want you to see it. I think I've mentioned it here a few times. But he says, don't allow the actions of evil men to cause you to burn with anger. Instead... So what's the temptation is, is that the evil men, their actions and what they say, what they do, what they proclaim, guess what it'll do on the inside of you? It'll cause you to burn with anger at how stupid somebody can be. Right? I, listen, I know we're all feeling that. Right? You, we see it. And it's broadcasted. It's talked about. Right? There's debates taking place on a regular basis. Right? You see it. And then he says, so instead, not that you just ignore all that. It's good to get inside understanding. But you don't do it to the point of looking to condemn or hurt somebody else. It's a human being. So he says, instead of getting burning with anger towards somebody or seeing their actions and getting all flustered and triggered by that, instead, burn with unrelenting passion as you worship God in holy awe. Because what's the enemy trying to do? He's trying to take away your passion. I just want you to see this. This is like... like Caution, caution. This is how the enemy works. What's he trying to do? He's trying to get your awe away. He's trying to pull off your passion. So you get so distracted on what people are doing, what people are saying, that you've lost your awe. So you try to come into the presence of God. You try to worship God on your own, and you feel it's just dry. Do you know why it's dry? It's because your anger is already towards somebody else. So your love for God can't, can't flourish. James says that in chapter, chapter 1, talking about two different types of waters coming out, right? There's the pure water, and then there's water that's the salty or whatever. It's just bad water. It says you can't come out of the same spout. So he's telling you, and I don't, don't forget about what they're saying. Yeah, like, man, that, that, I do not stand for that. I, this is what I do stand for. But instead, I'm going to just focus my attention on who my God is. I'm going to keep my awe. Oh, God, when's the last time you honestly stopped? And look at the foliage, the foliage. Look how pretty this looks. When's the last time you stopped and actually watched the sunset? It's early now, so you can watch it. <laughs> no, but when's the last time you actually stopped and smelled the roses? <laughs> you know who helped me with that? My son, Max. Ma my Max is my, he's my Max, and he is wonderful to me. He is, he's the greatest gift, and I believe he's God's gift regarding this, where he actually stopped and said, Papa, come look inside my pumpkin. So we carved, we had some pumpkins, and he put a bunch of secret stuff that he wants to give people. So he put a bunch of stuff in there. He says, Papa, I found this flower, and it's a weed. Yeah, I found this flower, <laughs> but he said this morning, I really want you to smell it. And meanwhile, you can kind of go, oh, man, I don't got, I got so much to do. All of a sudden, I just had on the inside. Stop and smell it. Nothing. <laughs> but what does he do? He helps just get my eyes on what really matters. People's lives are but a fart. <laughs> I kind of took Psalm 139 and made it my own. He says, your life is but a, uh, a vapor. Your life is but a fart. You're here. You make your scent. You leave. <laughs> you can have that. It's free. It's all yours. But all those people that are talking so proudfully, and this is what we're going to do, and I see this. Listen, their life is but a fart. But what's going to last forever? The word of God is going to last forever. 
So this is what I'm going to focus my attention on. Rather than somebody, you know, puffing smoke, doing something, saying something, I'm going to focus on the one who is never changing. What does that do? It keeps my passion towards him burning hot. Again, what do I do? I flip that switch. Whenever you do it with me, flip your switch. Flip it. It's my responsibility to flip my switch. Okay. And lastly, let's just finish off with this. Again, we're answering the question, so what do I do in regards to keeping my hunger for God? i got to guard my hunger. And then secondly, is I just simply have to make room for him. Just make room. And I'll show you how simple it is. In 2 Kings chapter 4, I want to just show you this. Give him room. You can have my heart, God. You can have my heart. If he asks, I want some time, I say yes. God, if you want me to, you want me to go to church today, his answer is usually Yes. So if you're wondering, if you have to pray about coming to church, just tell you what the Lord says. Yes. Okay. But Lord, if you want my time, yes. You want my, you want, do you want this Wednesday evening? Yes. It starts with just a simple, yes, I'll give it to you. Can you see how simple that is? He's not asking for the world. He's asking what you can give him. Because you, you already got it. But look at this, 2 Kings chapter 4, look at verse 8. One day Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she was urged to come to her home. Oh, sorry, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. Verse 9, she said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Verse 10, let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then when he, uh, he will have a place to stay whenever he comes. Say, make room. Make room. What did she do? Made room. Made room. That's all she did. I'm going to just set up a little bit of a, a table, a bed for him, for this man of God to come. What did she do? She made room for God. Yeah. Now let's continue on reading here. It says, one day, um, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to his upper room to rest. And he said to his servant Gehazi, verse 12, tell the woman from Sh- Shenhu, Sh- Shunem, Shunem, man, they probably think that of red deer, so let's, <laughs> I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied, my family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Now, I want you to see, it's not just Elisha asking. This is the Lord saying, what can we do? What can we do for them? Did you know that God is on your mind thinking about what can I do for them? What can I do for you? You make room for them, guess what? That's the first thing that comes on his mind. What can I do? God is not just a taker. He is a complete giver. So you may think, oh, man, I got... Okay, God, I'll give, I'll give you my Wednesday night. So you're kind of thinking, I'm giving it to him. So he's taking something from me. You will never outgive God. The first thing that came to his mind is, what, what can we do for this woman? Can you see that? The man of God saying, what can we do? So I see not just the man of God, I see that as a representation of God. This is what God's asking, what can I do? What can I do for that person? Later, Ash, again, Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, verse 15. Elisha told him, when the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. Now, I just want you to think of all the emotion that stirred up. Lord, we tried that. No, don't, don't, don't give my hopes up, man of God. Don't, don't, don't say those things. Those are things that we had, we had tried for, we had believed you for. Like, we can't, I don't, don't want to open that door again because it caused way too much pain. He said, no, next time next year you'll be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she cried, oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. This is something that was dear to her heart. But because she gave him room. Come on, say, make room. Look at the result, verse 17. Sure enough. Everybody say, Sure enough. Sure enough. Come on, sure enough, those desires of your heart, those things you've been standing for, those things you've been believing God for. It says this in Hebrews 11, verse 6, is that without faith it's impossible to please Him, and anyone who comes to God must believe that He is, and what? And that He is a rewarder. Come on, say it, rewarder. You give Him an inch, He will reward you. That's what He does. Go back to, guys, finish it off. Go back to verse uh, 17. Sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant, and at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. 
I just wanted to finish it off just re reminding you and I. Team, you guys want to come up. He's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's what he does. That's who he is. So I want to encourage you, those dreams, those things that you may have had on a vision board or you had in a journal or you wrote down on a piece of paper, have it stuffed in your sock drawer in the very, very back and haven't brought it back up because, man, I just it's too out there. I believe God for that 20 years ago. It just, I don't know how it's going to take place. Get it back. Come on, get it back. Those things that you've been standing for, those things that you knew were dreams, get it back. Why? And what do you do? You make room. You make room for him. Come on, say, make room. Make room, make room for him. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, Lord, I'm going to give you this time. I'm going to intentionally sow this time into my relationship with you. Watch it change. Watch him step up to the plate and feel those needs and those desires that you have. Remember, Jesus said this, that blessed are those that are hungry for righteousness and thirsty for righteousness. They will be filled. Filled. Come on, say, filled. 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 Shall we just sing that you can have my heart part for a second? I want you just to, in your own heart, I'm going to just say this. Let this be your confession this morning. Lord, you can have my heart. You can have my heart. Come on, eyes on him. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. Thank you, Lord. can have it all. You can have it all. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. Oh, 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 oh. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. Now we say time. Come on, just say it. You can have my time. 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 Yeah. Oh, no, no. You can have my time. You can have my time. Oh, and oh, no. You can have it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My plan is yours. Shelby, one more time. I want you to say dreams. I put it all before. You can have my dreams. sing it you place it before him Lord I give it you can have my dreams you can have my dreams Amy come help you can have my dreams you can have my Say heart. Heart. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. You can have my heart.
say family. Say family. You can have my family. You can have it. You can have it. You can have my relationships. You can have it. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. You can have my heart. Some of you got to stir this up on the inside. God is trying to get access to you right now. Let him in. Let him in. Shoot up those hands. You can have my plans. You can have them all. They're changeable to you, God. My agendas are changeable. My schedules are changeable. You can have my plans. I'm not in a rush to make something happen. I'm not in a hurry to try to make something go. No, no, no. You can have my heart. You can have my future. Sing it, Shelby. You can have my future. You can have my future. It's all in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, Thank you, Lord. You have a plan. You have a plan. Thank you, Father. Now, just while you're just sitting there for a moment, um, Shelby's just going to just sing this song to you as well. I want to just to minister to your heart. Don't move too quick and let him, if he's been talking to you, your plans, your future, your dreams, just give it to him and let her just sing this song to you. you do and everything you've done before. 
for me. And I thank you for all that you've done. Lord, you have my thanks. All that is to come. And all that is to come. And I thank you for all that you've done. And I thank you for all that you do. before we go today. Father, we're so thankful, Lord. Lord, we feed on your faithfulness. We feed on it. Father, we go over line upon line everything you've done in our lives, Father. You've given us breath in our lungs. Lord, you provided every single need. Lord, before that we knew you as Savior, you'd already taken care of it all. Father, you're our healer before we knew we needed a healer, before we knew we needed healing. You provided it. Father, you are our savior. Before we even knew we needed saving, thank you for it, Father. Thank you, Lord, you've healed our hearts, you've healed our souls. And Lord, today we just say again, fresh, Father, we are yours. We belong to you, our hearts belong to you, Father. And we are so thankful. We'll be known as a thankful church. We'll be known as a thankful group of people. We'll be known as thankful families. As the world gets darker, we'll continue to sing your praises. We'll continue to t sing of your, of your faithfulness and tell you how grateful we are, Lord. Thank you, Father. We're so thankful that you are faithful. 
Yes, you are. Thank you, Lord. And you know, church, as you go on your week this week, I just want to encourage you, there's no easier way to have an encounter with the Lord than to tell Him how thankful you are, to cultivate that thankfulness. You know, if you've been feeling like you haven't really been encountering Him, well, first of all, I suggest you listen to this message again. But secondly, I suggest you cultivate that thankfulness. Just start somewhere. Thank Him for the fact that you're standing upright today, living and breathing. And then cultivate that throughout your day. Think of little things to thank Him for. You know, that does wonders in a marriage. Can you imagine how that does with, a, with your Lord and Savior? When just all the little things. Thank you for the leaves. Thank you, we've had an amazing um, Albertan fall, right? Start there, and I guarantee your encounters with the Lord are gonna be incredible. So just before you leave, I'm gonna just finish with this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So we speak that over you and your family, over your Thanksgiving day today or tomorrow, in Jesus' name. We love you so very much. Thank you for being part of our family. We're truly blessed to know you. Have a great rest of your day.